a little joke to tell you about the Superwoman straight Wonder Woman uh, thing that's very embarrassing, and I know my phone is turned off now, so it won't happen today. But my ringtone on my phone used to be the Batman song, you know, da 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 Anyway, um, so I had got up somewhere else, done a speech, and someone else who was very, very important and from a World Bank had got up to do her speech. And my phone went off. And yes, <laughs> it was really, really embarrassing. And I thought it was my ringtone, someone was calling me. It wasn't, it was an alarm. And you know the alarm goes off even when the phone is off. So I'm trying to turn the phone off. And I worked out eventually it was an alarm, but it got louder and louder. And in the end, the speaker turned around and said, Sandy, the back cave is calling you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm not Superwoman, I'm not Wonder Woman, and I have nothing to do with Batman whatsoever. Um, but I have had um, an interesting career. I have had and continue to have, and I hope I will have for a long time, an interesting life. Um, but it's not something that I see myself as anything extraordinary, uh, anything that um, I'm not in any way near finished either, um, so I hope to add things to that list. But I think everything I've done is completely achievable. And if someone like me, who I consider myself a very lazy person actually, um, and can do, I think anyone can do it. And I, everyone I tend to meet um, tends to be a lot less lazier than I am. Um, but I think one thing I probably have had um, that some people maybe lack is the never giving up gene. And in all the years I've been doing what I've been doing, what I've noticed actually is some people who are way more capable, way more able, way more better educated than me have given up because there have been certain barriers that they felt they haven't overcome. So the only difference I think that I can honestly stand here and say that could possibly <coughs> entitle me to stand here and say anything to you is the fact that I haven't given up. So what I thought today was I would tell you a little bit of my story and my journey, but at the same time, because that is not really the most interesting thing, is tell you some of the things people have told me that I've chosen to ignore, that I think have actually contributed to my success. Because often we're told things that we should do. I'm going to tell you the things people tell you you should do, but you should ignore. And why you should ignore them, and why they'll actually really, really contribute to your success. So it's a little bit of a story on the way, uh, it, it, how I get to be here in front of you tonight with that wonderful introduction. But also I think you, it will resonate with everybody because you've all heard uh, these things. So I'm going to go back to um, when I was very young. Uh, I was seven or eight, and I was at primary school. And I think one of the first things that um, really struck me um, was, and I, I, I say this to everybody that I talk to and that I mentor, is don't take advice you don't like, okay? Um, and you know the advice you don't like because you feel it. It's very intuitive. And you think that can't be right. But there's something about us that if someone in authority, someone you think should know the answer to that, gives you that advice, there's a feeling that you should follow it. And I'm telling you, don't. Don't do that. Stay with your instincts and stick with what you want to do. When I was seven, I was at school. This was a very, very long time ago. This is when there was old money and there were no smartphones and you know there was no internet. There was a library. That's how you looked up stuff. Um, and so I was at school and the teacher was going around the classroom and she was asking everybody what they wanted to do when they grew up. And I had a, what I thought was a really, truly brilliant answer, because there were lots of stupid answers coming, like footballer and princess and things like that. So teacher came to me and had my perfect plaits with my ribbons and everything. I was waiting for her to get to me. And she said, Sandy, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a judge. And she turned around to me, quick as a flash, and said, I'm sorry, Sandy, but little black girls from Ballon don't become judges. Now, that'll probably get her sacked today. Um, it didn't even get so much as a tut-tut back then. Um, but I do remember thinking to myself then, first of all, after the embarrassment had faded and the humiliation, because I was seven and I thought I was being really clever and obviously it wasn't, um, was that, you know, what do you know, actually? You know, you're a teacher, you're not a judge. And secondly, well, if they don't now, they're going to. And I think that was... Maybe it was a defiance, maybe it was, I'm going to show you, um, but I knew that feeling then wasn't going to stop me. 
And uh, maybe that came from the fact I had a very strong mother who said nothing is ever going to stop you doing anything um, except you. And I think she that was absolutely true. But when I look back on it now, she was a person of authority. She was a teacher. And not only was a teacher, she was an adult. And adults, you know, you, when, when you're a child and an adult tells you something, you tend to think they know what they're talking about. So I look at back, back at that and I think, do not always take on board what people in authority tell you is the truth. Because sometimes they can actually be wrong. Sometimes they can actually not know what they're talking about. And it can do you a lot of harm and a lot of damage if you take that on board. Because I could have taken that very differently. And I could have thought, well, that's it. That's the end of my ambitions. I have to say, I have to caveat it, I'm not a judge. But that's not the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> I could be one if I wanted to. I could apply for that. That option is now open to me because I've chosen a legal path and I've got to a particular place in the career. I have got that choice if that's something I want to do in the future. I would not have had that choice if I'd listened to that lady. And often people will ask me, what would you do if you went back to see that teacher? And I would say to her, thank you for actually saying that to me and giving me something to strive for. So the other thing is that sometimes things that can seem like a stopper to you can actually be the catalyst to change you. And you have to really grab that and take that on board. One of the other things I had along the line as I started my career, so I, I you know, did well in my exams and I went to university, etc. and I trained to be uh, a barrister and solicitor. And so when I was starting off, uh, one of the <laughs> pieces of advice I got was, oh, change your surname, a coro, it's very ethnic sounding. And at that point in time, I'd married a Mr. Hopkins, so I could have become Sandy Hopkins. He's no longer around, wasn't up to the job, so he's gone. <laughs> Which is <was> another, <laughs> it's another reason why I didn't change my name. Because um, it would have been really embarrassing. <laughs> um, so I thought, no, I don't want to change my name. I'm who I am. That's really important to me, my surname. It's very distinctive. Not if you go to Nigeria, isn't it? It's like Smith. But over here, it's very distinctive. And I didn't want to lose it. And my instincts told me, don't do that. Because they were saying, you really won't get a job in the city in the kind of places you want to work for. They'll see it in, on your CV and they won't interview you. Now, firstly, I found that very, very strange that, that anyone thought that was good advice. Because why is it better to walk in as a Sandy Hopkins and someone thinking you're something else and then when they see you, you see the look on their face. That is not nice. I mean, we've probably all been there at some point for something, but actually, why would you want to put yourself through that? So my view is I'm definitely keeping it because I don't want to work for a firm that thinks like that. And if they see my name and they still interview me, clearly they don't think like that. To me, that was logic. I know I'm a lawyer and I'm very good at logic, but to me, it just seemed like common sense. And that has worked very well for me. And I've worked for some of the most British of British institutions in the city, so it was also rubbish advice. So I've worked for Schroders, I've worked for Bearings, I now work for HSBC, I'm on the board of the RSC, and I do, um, I sit on the Equality Standards Panel of the Premier League. Very, very, very British institutions, that if I listened to that piece of advice about changing my name, I might not have got the start that I got in the city, that gave me the courage to know, you know what, you might think places like that are, are like that, and they're not. There may be some places that are like that, but I didn't work there because they saw my name in the CV and they gave me an interview. And that is really, really, really important because there's a lot of stereotyping out there both ways. Don't fall for it. Okay? Everyone will walk around, there's this unconscious bias that we all have, and it's to do with your upbringing, it's to do with when you were born, all sorts of things. The point about it, it's unconscious. You don't realise you have it. But don't take on other biases that other people will give you. Try it and see. And a lot of the advice along those lines I've had throughout my career have actually not transpired to be the case. And I'm not saying it's an easy place to be, the city, for anyone. It's not easy, particularly more so if you're female. It's not particularly easier if you are a person of colour. But it's not as hard as people make out. And that's the important thing. And it never has been in my experience. Everywhere is hard. Now, actually, a lot of those issues have fallen away. And it's about you working hard and succeeding and wanting to do it. But it starts with you wanting to do it and not finding excuses why you can't. Because all along, someone had to be the first, and someone was always going to be the first. And when you get there, you bring others along with you. 
So it's a little bit of courage, which I think you always need for any success in the future for getting to the top. You will always need courage. There will come a point in your career that is a real catalyst where courage plays the part, where you turn around and you either say, no, we can't do it that way, or no, we should do it that way. When, and you're going against the grain. And that takes courage. So when you turn around to people who say, we'll try and tell you not to do something along the way, and you have the courage to say, do you know what, it's really interesting, but I'm holding up hand and I'm not listening and I'm going forward on my way, that takes courage. And you will need that courage later on. People don't really succeed if they don't have courage of their own convictions and their own belief in themselves. If you don't believe in yourself, who else is going to believe in you? And if you believe you can do it, and I truly do believe this, if it's something you want to do, and you really want to do it, and you really feel you should do it, you can do it. Because that momentum and that self-belief will get you 90% of the way, and hard work, 10% of hard work will get you the rest of the way. If it's something you don't really want to do, and you think it's something you should do, and we've all been there, doesn't matter how hard you work, you hate working hard, and you don't enjoy it when you get there. Things we want to do, things we enjoy, things that really drive us, things that make us feel passionate, uh, that we feel passionate about, we will succeed in. It's finding that in yourself and understanding what that is about. And that really is, to me, success, is doing what you want to do. It's not necessarily the accolades and the big job and the big money, because they don't always make you happy when you get there. What makes you happy is achieving what you wanted to achieve, and going, yeah, I did that. And you can see that with athletes when they win their medals. They work really, really hard for that. And you know, all their life's work has been put into winning that gold medal. And when they get it, it's the best thing in the world. The question is, what is your gold medal? It's got to be what you want to do, not what someone tells you you need to do. And I don't think there's one athlete out there on the track, on the football field, anywhere, who doesn't actually want to be there, because the amount of training they have to do. You can't do that if you hate that. And, and I know this now from my work at the RSC. You know, it all seems very glamorous being an actor, doesn't it? You just troop out there, stand there, get the applause, thank you very much, and go and get your Oscar. The work you have to, that has to go into that is unbelievable. The work you need to do, night after night, in the theatre, even if you're doing work in television, is very, very hard. It is not glamorous. In the theatre, you've got to remember your lines and do the performance night after night. In TV, you do a couple of lines, someone says, stop, I want it like this. It is so not glamorous. You have to really love that to want to do that. And I remember doing a, a couple of interviews for things, and they kept stopping and starting. I thought, I'm fed up with this. I don't want to do this anymore. I thought you just got up and did it. No, stop, start, I want it from this angle. Nothing is as easy as it seems. No one has it easy. But you can make it a lot easier on yourself by being easier on yourself and not telling yourself what you can't do and going for what you really want to do. So further along, I'm going along in my career and things are going very well. And I suddenly have this real desire to work in the city. I wanted to be a human rights lawyer. And somewhere along the line, I thought, no, I actually want to go and work in the city. There are not very many people like me in the city. I think that's what I want to do. Don't ask me why, I just thought that one day. Um, I didn't have this burning passion to do it. I had this burning passion to be a lawyer, but I had this real instinct that the city is where I should go and do it. And again, it cropped up. Oh, someone like you really doesn't make it in the city. You're making your life hard for yourself. Why don't you go and do this? And I thought, intuitively, that doesn't sound right because you're talking about now. You know, and this is at the beginning of my career. And this is what else I think is very important, is that you <coughs> need to have vision to be successful and to be a successful leader. And a statement like that shows a lack of vision in other people because they're not actually imagining what the future might look like. And there's a lot of that that goes on. You're talking about the status quo now. And often things are built around the status quo now, not what might happen in the future. And you, the point with the future is you can't predict it. You can't predict it 100%. But you can see the trend of change. And if you look at the way that diversity has become a really important aspect of um, business, of everyday life, of education, that's not really a surprise because with the internet, with the global marketplace, 
Our customers are diverse. That's obvious. You know, you just have to set up an internet company from your house and you can have customers all over the world. So how do you appeal to customers all over the world? Well, first obvious one is you try and put different languages on your website so they can understand what they're all doing if English isn't their first language. Simple things, so therefore you need some people who speak the different languages you want to put up there. That's a simple example of diversity. And that's a simple example of why you have different people in your workforce. Now, if you want to appeal to different people across the world, you want to appeal to men as you do to women, you want to appeal to, to people who are gay, to people who are straight, to whoever, people with a disability, you have to be diverse. You, one size does not fit all in the way that it used to. Not that it ever did, actually. We put up with it because that's all we had. But it doesn't anymore. And I'll give you a really good example of makeup. So, uh, <laughs> some of the ladies in the room know what I'm saying. Um, up until fairly recently, if you wanted to go and buy foundation, ladies, there was probably one or two counters you went to to buy foundation that will match your skin. And they were not Estee Lauder, they weren't, you know, the big brand names. They are now. They do it all shades across the spectrum. Okay? It's not a specialist thing anymore. And it was only when I was in one of the big stores recently, I suddenly noticed this, that everybody was supplying different shades of foundation, um, not that mix it up to, to, like, you know, the paint, Dulux paint to match, but, um, you know, actual <laughs> different shades. Um, and where, how had that suddenly turned around? Because actually, there was a consumer demand. People realise you need to sell to different people if you want to keep in this market. And there's a market there. And we should never, ever forget that, is that we are always consumers at the other end of things. So how do we like to be sold to? How are people appealing to us? And that is really, really very important. And in your successful careers, you've got to think about your customers as well. And you've got to think, how do various products, brands appeal to you? What is it about it that appeals to you? Because it appeals about something that's authentic in you and you like that. And it actually, they may have made it easier, they may have made it more accessible, like they have done with the foundation. But the point is someone has recognized that there is a brand, that there is a product out there that is acquired. Now why I mentioned foundation is they didn't just put one color, because someone somewhere said it's not one color. It's a number of colours, a number of different shades. Just because that's the other thing that happened first. When you started to get foundation for darker skin, it was one colour. Um, and then now, actually, it's different shades. Just because for lighter skins, it was different shades. And someone thought, oh, we'll do foundation for black skin, one colour. I mean, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> so just an example of the way having diversity within your workforce, someone sat there and thought, you know what, this is the way that we need to do it. So the idea that someone like you won't make it because they don't have people like you, whatever they mean like that, lacks vision. And if that is, you don't want to work for that person, you don't want to work with that person, you want to work with people who have vision and can see what's going on in the future. I'm getting the five minute wind up over there. I haven't even got started really. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really important, I've, I've uh, touched on this before, it's about being your authentic self. And one of the things I was told, and still get told, is tone it down a bit. You know, just tone it down a bit. Um, no, ramp it up. Don't ever tone it down. Be your authentic self. The more you can be your authentic self, the more you'll find yourself in an authentic place where you really belong, and the more you will have to offer. And this is absolutely true. So if you try and fit in thinking, um, oh, okay, you know, if I want to go and work in the city, then I have to have a certain hairstyle and I have to dress a certain way. You have to be smart and you have to be well-groomed because you're talking probably about people's money and they like people who are handling their money to look well-groomed and appropriate. But that doesn't mean you don't have your own personality showing and you do it the way that you want to do it. If you're not comfortable in yourself, so you've gone and given yourself some hairstyle or some suit that really doesn't suit you, you feel uncomfortable in, just isn't you, you won't perform at your best. And companies want you to perform at your best. 
So you have to take your authentic self to work. And this is why I feel so passionately about diversity and diversity programs in the workplace, because it allows people to be themselves. Uh, you don't leave your personality at the door when you walk in on you know, nine o'clock in the morning and pick it up on the way out at six o'clock in the evening. You don't, it's there. But if there's something you feel you have to hide, something that isn't a genuine you, it means you're so busy doing that, you're not really doing the job that the company wants you to do. So being at your best and allowing others to be their authentic self is really important. And one of the things I think that's been fantastic that I have seen change is the LGBT um, progression in the workplace. Because, and still to some extent, I think it's still there, that you know, I have pictures of my children on my, on my desk. Um, but you very rarely see same-sex couples having a picture of their same-sex partner on the desk. I'm not saying it's frowned on, but people don't feel as comfortable doing it, and that is wrong. We shouldn't be in that era right now. But if you make people feel comfortable about being their true selves and expressing their true selves, so you know when you have that big Christmas party and you take your other half, and your other half can be the same sex as you, that must make people feel comfortable, and they will, they will perform better. And the other thing is, don't forget, your customers are like that as well. Your customers are diverse. Your customers come from all sorts of different groups. How are you making them feel comfortable? How are you making them think, yes, we want you to be a customer? Because who wants to spend money on a product where the makers of that product don't think they would have you as an employee in their firm? That's not right either. So there's a flip side to every coin in all of this, is that whatever you're thinking about yourself, whatever authenticity you need to bring to the workplace about yourself, You've got to allow your customers and your clients to bring that same authenticity as well. And think what you're doing to allow them to do that in a comfortable space.